Do I have gills? He does not have gills. You hear that? No gills. So I can't be a fish. And I'm a genius voice of a generation. Happy September. Sequel time. Hi, I'm Kitty Monk, and I'm here to talk to you about South Park, or more specifically, the topic of celebrities. As we all know, being mocked on South Park is an honor of the highest proportion, and a sure sign that you've made it in your respective field, or you done effed up at the pans. About a month ago, I made a video on the top 10 celebrities who hated how South Park portrayed them. Afterwards, many of you requested a sequel, but in the vein of celebrities who actually loved what South Park said, and I am very happy to provide the list. But before we begin, unlike last time, we have to set up a few ground rules. To make it onto the list, they can't have starred in the episode as themselves. To me, if they agreed to be on South Park in the first place, chances are they probably enjoyed the show or knew what they were getting into. That means we can't include people like PewDiePie, Roberto Smith, or Elon Musk. And we also can include celebrities who voice characters even if they weren't themselves, like Jennifer Aniston, Josh Gad, etc. Again, they're probably fine being made fun of. Just know that even if it feels like I'm limiting myself, I'm really not. Trust me, compared to last time, I practically had my pickings. It was so hard to choose at times. So let's begin, unlike before, with honorable mentions. This time around, we have about three. It's probably my most so far. The first is Paris Hilton from Stupid Spoiled's video playset. I'm sure by now we all know the tale of Paris Hilton, which is almost as insightful as the tale of Lemmy Winks. Trey and Matt made an episode about Paris, which in not so many words said she wasn't the kind of person little girls should be looking up to. And after the episode aired, Paris supposedly said that she was flattered to be featured, which angered Matt and Trey immensely. Apparently, the story isn't as true as we've been led to believe. The idea that she was quote-unquote flattered was a comment made by her journalist. She did not even see the real episode at the time. In recent years, Paris has sort of cleaned up her act, or through a more cynical eye, used PR to rebrand her image. Anyway, she showed that her childhood wasn't all sunshine and lollipops, and that during her infamous party girl phase, she was going through problems, and the media wasn't making it any better. This year, Paris wrote a memoir, Paris, the memoir, catchy title, where she went on to describe what she really thought about the episode. I'm the title character, but they also apply that epithet to Britney Spears, Christina Aguilera, Tara Reid, and all the little girls who were fans, which upset me more than anything ugly they could say about me. It also upset me that the episode graphically portrays my dog Tinkerbell being shot and killed. The thought of that made me sick. I've been involved in some pretty edgy media, but I don't even know where something like that comes from. To make matters worse, apparently Paris met Matt and Trey prior to the episode and described them as cool and interesting. She went on to say, When a journalist told Matt about my muted red carpet response, he said, That shows how f***ed up she is. My not wanting to watch his cartoon about my dog being shot and me coughing up f***ed, that's evidence of how f***ed up I am. So I'm not gonna add Paris to the list, and I'm glad I at least did more research. The second candidate is Danica Patrick. Danica Patrick, if you're unaware, was a driver for NASCAR. I say was because she's retired, but back in her heyday, she was known for practically being the only woman in NASCAR. 
That's not to say she's the only woman to ever be in NASCAR. She broke the glass ceiling. But whereas there are other women in the sport nowadays, ever since Danica retired, none have competed in the main event, the Cup. In the episode Poor and Stupid, Cartman becomes a driver, and he interacts with Danica Patrick. Can we just get back to the subject of racing, please? Oh, bring it on, Danica. You dumb <laughs> I think I can't steer left better than you? The only reason Danica did not make the list was because there's only 10 spots. I was tempted to put her as a number 11, but I'm not Doug Walker. I do top 10 lists. At one point to try and win the race, Cartman drives over Danica. <laughs> you, Danica Patrick! You ain't half as dumb as me! Gas pedal! During an appearance on Joe Rogan, Danica said she was honored to be in the episode. To her, South Park was a major sign she made it. And you know what? I can't fault her. I guess you could say the same thing about Rob Schneider, Tina Yothers, and to a small degree, Jared Vogel. And finally, Caesar Milan. Don't get me wrong, originally I wanted to include him so bad, but by the time I put him on the list, I realized all 10 spots were already filled and there was no more room. Caesar, if you're watching this, I'm so sorry, but like I said above, there were a ton of celebrities to choose from. It was hard to pick. Regardless, Caesar Milan is best known as the Dog Whisperer, and he's invited to reign in Cartman in his terrible behavior. After Cartman ruins his chances on every nanny TV show. And what exactly keeps me on the stool? It's the time out stool. You can't get down until the time is up. Well, the nannies attempted to treat Cartman like a child. That was the problem. Caesar treats him like a feral animal. Man, this guy doesn't- Ah! Quit it! What is that you're doing? Dogs show their dominance by nipping each other on the neck. I just use two fingers, nip at the child's neck. Doesn't hurt the child, just let him know I am dominant. Admittedly, some people have said that Caesar's techniques are inhumane or incorrect. But I'm not gonna get into that at the current moment. Come on, this is Cartman. Whatever works, I'm sure it's a right to try on him. Unless it's something sponsored by Nambla. Cartman is evil, but I do indeed have standards. Caesar Milan loves this episode, and even reacted to it on his YouTube channel. The link of which I'll include in the description. Alright, this section was way longer than I thought it needed to be. Let's get started. comedian but not being funny come on Kanye I just take jokes and repackage them with a Mexican accent oh but kitty who is Carlos Mencia I, I don't know okay I don't know I was sheltered but the obscurity if you want to know this is why he's number 10 if you're like me and ignorant of this man let me give you a rundown Carlos Mencia was a comedian best known for starring on the Comedy Central sketch comedy show, Mind of Mencia. The show aired from 2005 to 2008, and they had four seasons. The reason it stopped running was because, to put it bluntly, Carlos Mencia is an unfunny man who steals jokes from bigger, more talented comedians, including George Lopez, Bobby Lee, among others. He's also made really insensitive jokes about Hurricane Katrina, saying, I'm glad Hurricane Katrina happened. It taught us an important lesson. Black people can't swim. Yeah, it's no wonder he doesn't really do anything nowadays. The only thing I think he does TV-wise is the Proud Family revival. Basically, Sal Park could say whatever they wanted about him. In the episode, Jimmy and Cartman start the funniest joke known to man, but because they took too long to claim credit, Carlos Mencia swoops in like a vulture and says he started it. Well, you know, I was just kicking it with my homies and my brain. You know, my brain's always so full of ideas because I'm so funny and stuff. <laughs> That's just how I came up with it, me amigos. Elsewhere, Kanye West, the only person who did not get the joke, thinks it's been personally manufactured to make fun of him, and has his posse track down whoever started all this. Finally, he gets his claws on the dude. You told us to track down whoever started the whole fish stick thing. 
We found out who, dog. Come on, man. What is this, man? Lay pro tip to my viewers. Don't take credit for things you did not do. Or a rapper who has yet to become a raging anti-Semite with mental health problems will tie you up and beat you silly. I ain't gonna hurt you. I pay people to do that for me. Now beat that dude with a bat. Now beat that dude with a bat. Now beat that dude, beat that dude, beat that dude with a bat. Before delivering the finishing blow, Kanye interrogates him personally. Why do people think I'm a gay fish? <laughs> Cause... <laughs> you're a... You're a gay fish, man! But the real Carlos Mencia, who is still alive, posted a series of tweets where he praised the crew for including him. He said, They just made fun of me on South Park. I thought it was hysterical. Catch the rerun. I was parodied in an episode of South Park last night. People kept asking me about it. I couldn't stop laughing. It was hilarious. Watch it. I'm not a gay fish. I stole a joke. Ha 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 ha. I thought South Park was hilarious and an honor. Keeps Reading the Mencia word. I love fish sticks. Fun fact, all of this came from a cracked article about how unfunny Carlos Mencia is. And thank you to the crew for including him, because this is pretty much the reason I know Carlos Mencia even exists. And this is what I think he's like in real life. A sniveling coward who steals jokes. These <laughs> must be punished in front of everyone! You swore on the cross, that's all. Yeah. Too bad for you. It was a double cross. Oh, God. Wait, I can't say that. I'm using the Lord's name in vain. Even if apparently that's not what it means, I heard. For those of you who don't know, Bill Donahue is the president of the U.S. Catholic League and known for being a bit of an activist. For, let's say, controversial reasons. You want to know more? Google his responses to Jews, Christmas, and priests doing things to little boys. Or what he thought about the Sisters of Perpetual indulgence. Prior to this episode, he called Matt and Trey names, saying, The ultimate hypocrite is not Comedy Central. That's their decision not to show the footage of Muhammad, not Parker and Stone, like little- <laughs> They sit there and grab the bucks. They'll sit there and they'll whine and they'll take their shot at Jesus. That's their stock and trade. And the pair thought this gave them license to mock him. I'm not knocking them. I totally get it. In Fantastic Easter Special, Stan learns that Easter is really a front. To prevent people from finding out, St. Peter was a rabbit. Long story. And the real heir to the Pope throne, I guess that's what it's called, is a rabbit named Snowball. With the cat out out of the bag, the Catholic League, led by Bill Donahue, tries to capture Snowball and take him to the Pope. What's funny is that Bill Donahue is shown as being too much of a fervent Christian. Look, I'm pretty sure even a combo of Stan Smith, Ned Flanders, and the Republic of Gilead would think he's going too far. Pope Benedict, who actually looks pretty well this time, is portrayed as mostly a good guy, just doing what he thinks is the right thing. Like, I know he wants to get rid of Snowball, but I could see him just keeping Snowball in a little cage, not killing him. It's actually Bill Donahue who keeps advocating for violence. All this torturing and ninjas, it just doesn't seem very Christian. You asked for the help of the American Catholic League, let us do our job! At one point, Jesus Christ himself gets involved to set the record straight, and Bill Donahue calls him a Jew and locks him away, including the Pope. Kill him! What? He goes against the church, he must die! Alright, that does it, Bill. I'm pretty sure that killing Jesus is not very Christian. Seriously, why hasn't he teamed up with Cartman? He crowns himself the Pope, Pope Bill Donahue, he does not take a papal name, and he's intent on boiling Snowball and the hair club for men alive. My people! This Easter, I'm gonna start by making our rabbit stew ten times media! Yeah! Damn, this dude just goes above and beyond. Good thing he forgot Jesus has rockin' ninja moves. I'm the Pope now! That means I am the voice of God! Not anymore. I'm removing you from your position. 
After this episode aired, Bill Donahue said even if he didn't like South Park, he liked how the show portrayed him. He commented, In the episode, they have me overthrow the Pope because the Pope is a wimp. And then I take over the church and give it some guts. But in the end, Jesus kills me. Apparently, he also keeps a picture of South Park him wearing the Pope hat, or whatever it's called, in his office. The reason this is so low is because it seems like it did not not really rattle him, considering his complaints. Which is enough, from what I gathered, he's a pretty stubborn man. And I'm kinda biased, because Bill Donahue, I'm sorry, Pope Bill Donahue, is my all-time favorite South Park parody. Just saying, you guys could not have him team up with Cartman. You had Cartman hang out with Rob Reina. They can get away with not having a hot pass? Think again! How was that, Butters? That was pretty good! Obligatory. Nice. I know, it's awful. I'm feeding into a double standard. Let's move on. Back in the day, there was this show called Dog the Bounty Hunter, about a man named Dog Chapman, his wife, and his children working as bounty hunters in Hawaii. Wait, so if the show took place in Hawaii, does that mean they're native Hawaiians? What made their show special was outside of the Ozzy theme song, Dog was an ex Fallon for third degree murder. Apparently it was because he was in the getaway car, I don't know. And he's not legally allowed to carry a firearm. Instead, he tries to be as non-violent as possible, or use bear mace to subdue any possible bounties. Of course, there were controversies involved with the show, especially in terms of pay and issues with his sons, but Sal Park did not want to make fun of that. Instead, Cartman is chosen by Mackie and Victoria to be the school hall monitor. You need to watch for bad behavior and make sure anyone in the halls during class has a hall pass. If anyone doesn't, you have the authority to bring them to me. Authority? I get it. It's his turn, but why couldn't they just skip over him? Guys, you all know who Carbon is. Why would you trust him in positions of authority? This time, rather than parody cops, he parodies Dog. He becomes the big bad dog, the hallway monitor. And he burns people with bear mace for minor infractions before telling them to go with Christ, bro. Regardless of what exactly they did, I mean, he does it to butters at one point. Look, bro, I had to bring you in, but I don't have any hard feelings against you, alright? Huh? Here, you need a smoke, bro? You gotta give yourself over to Christ, bro. He doesn't care about the fact Miss Stevenson, who becomes his archenemy, keeps molestering Ike until Kyle says they were making out in the hallways without a hall pass. You like Bear Mace, Ice Head? Bear Mace? You're going with Christ! <laughs> oh! Miss Stevenson, you're having a relationship with this student? Yes. During class time without a hall pass. You go, dude, for once in your life. The funny part is, again, Cartman does not let this grudge go. After Stevenson uses the Mel Gibson defense to only get rehab, it inspires him to get craftier. He won't rest until she's in the slammer or dead, whatever comes first. Later, Kyle goes to him for help after Stevenson escapes with Ike to go to Milan. He hires a girl named Beth with giant hooters, which are bigger than mine, to act as his B-word, and two guys to help, only having to pay them 15 bucks. She ran away now, she got to deal with the dog, huh? Beth found out they have a room at the airport Hilton. We need to search it. Here's the hotel. Beth, tell you where to pull up here. One music video filmed later, and they're off, while Miss Stevenson commits on a lie. Who cares? Ike is saved. All thanks to the dog. I think you should leave before I call the police. Beth, there they say again! And speaking of the dog, the real dog and his family loved the episode. Biff Chapman even said she wished they made her boobs bigger. As for the real dog, he pretty much gave the standard blah blah blah, I'm happy they honored me, blah blah blah, and the end. Sorry, not one person in specific. Just to simplify things, we're going to include the whole damn cast. Now something I make especially clear is I'm from Jersey. Newark to be specific. 
Sheila, it's one syllable, not two. I can tell you're not from here. People might hate Jersey, and whenever I tell people outside of Jersey that I'm from Nork, I get dirty looks. But besides everything being super expensive, it's not that bad. As for Jersey Shore, trust me, most everybody here hates that show. As much as everybody else, if not more so. It gave Jersey even worse of a rap, and most of them are not even from Jersey. They're just loud and annoying. And I'm Italian, so I can tell when somebody's being loud and annoying. Especially because the episode aired on my birthday. I love it. And it tells the world what we were all thinking. Sheila, who are you talking to? You wouldn't understand. It's a Jersey thing. And yes, we do indeed talk off to the side, Malcolm in the middle style. You wouldn't understand. It's a Jersey thing. More and more Jersey people are moving to South Park, likely to escape the super high taxes and spotted lanternflies. This results in South Park being overrun with them, like a colony of moles. And they make the mistake of trying to be polite to them, or inviting them over for dinner. Big mistake. The townsfolk must do whatever they can to get the Jerseyans out of Colorado. More people from Jersey are showing up in our town. If we don't do something, South Park is going to become West Jersey. <sighs> Guys, there is no West Jersey. There is a North Jersey. There is a South Jersey. And unfortunately, there's no debate anymore. The governor made a Central Jersey. But there is no West Jersey. That's stupid. That's like saying Taylor Ham's a pork roll. One night at the Sizzler, the townsfolk encounter a Snooky. It's one of them! That thing's from Jersey too! <laughs> what is it? It's called a Snooky. It's very famous. Now, I'm sure we all know who Snooky is. A small little thing with a crazy hairstyle. And also, I think she still does shows, I think. I don't know. In the world of South Park, Snooky is like Snarf. If Snarf wore fuzzy slippers and wants nothing more than to smush mush. And she doesn't care how she gets it or who she gets it from. Snooky smush! Shut it! Eventually, the townspeople, with the help of Al-Qaeda, are able to push back against Jersey. And Kyle, tapping into his Jersey blood, shoes away Snooky. <laughs> After the episode aired, pretty much everybody involved loved it and took to social media to show their thanks. Snooki, to this very day, has constantly said how much she loves it, hence her and the cast getting their own section, and not an honorable mention like Danica. Snooki wants smush smush. I'm going to have nightmares tonight, LMAO. We've officially made it. In 2021, she even posted a gif of Snooki from South Park saying, my South Park episode was my my best look by far. Ah, oh, what a joke, little gremlin. My face was on South Park. I'm good now, said Vinny. South Park situation. Hilarious. And let me just say, if you don't like this episode or New Jersey, screw you, you garbage, and you trash, and cabbage. Your cabbage. Why don't you take a seat? Oh, I don't want to take a seat. Have a seat. No, I'm just gonna go- Take a seat, right over there. How does he do that? Yay, we get to talk about Chris Hansen! Why don't you have a seat right there? In the episode, Le Petit Tourette, as we all know, Cartman fakes having Tourette's in order to have an excuse to curse as much as possible, and also to call Jews every bad word in the book, and be inspirational while doing it. To this end, he gets an interview with Chris Hansen, or as the man in question calls himself, Tonight, an inside look at Tourette Syndrome. I'm Chris Hansen. Yes, you really have to emphasize all of the syllables for his name to make sense. Trust me, he's not Chris Hansen. He's Chris Hansen. However, Cartman starts to have a reverse kind of Tourette's. Instead of cursing whenever, because he no longer has a filter, he starts to leak embarrassing secrets. And uh, I'm secretly in love with Patty Nelson. I fantasize about kissing Patty Nelson. Ew. He personally goes to Chris Hansen to try and get out of the show. Too bad Chris Hansen has other ideas. It'd be a shame if you didn't want to go on Dateline. It'd be a shame if we had to track you down and you 
shot yourself. I just peed my pants. Samsies. Thankfully, Cartman doesn't have to go through with it. Kyle and Thomas summoned a bunch of Herberts to the studio. And Thomas even cursed out Chris Hansen for good measure. What? Nobody talks to me like that. Why don't you take a seat? Take a seat right over there. Suck it! <laughs> Why you I'll, I'll tell on you! Now, I'm sure y'all are wondering what the real Chris Hansen fought. Well, it's pretty sweet, honestly. Before the episode premiered, which if you watched my previous videos, you'd know it's a controversy in and of itself because of all the cursing. Anyhow, Chris Hansen learned from his agent he would be featured, but he did not watch the episode when it aired. He was told that near the end, things had quote, gotten dark. Eventually, he saw the episode episode for himself and loved it. What makes this entry especially heartwarming for me is his sons, who were all big fans of South Park, watched the episode with their friends and said he earned cool points because he was featured. The reason Chris Hansen made the list was because, to me, it's always super cool when a celebrity's kids are able to see their work, especially if they think it's silly. Rachel McFarlane said her role as Odalia Blight was pretty personal because for the longest time, she only really did adult cartoons and her daughters were not allowed to watch them. And when I got to ask Stephen Colbert about Rick and Morty, he said his sons were huge fans of the show, so he had a fun time being there. Granted, I wonder what they thought about him being in Venture Brothers and how he kept getting recast, especially by Bill Hader. I'm the editor. My fighting is poetry! You don't edit Russell Crowe's poetry! Oh my god, it's Russell Crowe! Oh my god, it's Russell Crowe! Oh my god, it's Russell Crowe! Well, you don't have to be rude. I actually liked you and Lay Miss Russell Crowe, and this is how you repay me? Don't try to fight me. I'm from Jersey. As celebrities, Matt and Trey have friends in the industry, even if they don't seem as prolific as they were back then. One of those friends is Russell Crowe. Russell Crowe invited the pair to a listening party for one of his new albums, which they described as Bon Jovi meets Hepatitis B. And this makes me wonder what they thought about Javert. He refused to listen to any criticism, especially from Trey. When Trey suggested he shouldn't include hand claps, suddenly the room grew quiet. Russell Crowe then took a drag off his cigarette and said, well maybe I'll mix them off the version I give to you. Keep in mind that Trey Parker is a trained musician. He studies the piano, he's a music major, and he even attended the prestigious Berklee College of Music in Boston for like a semester, but that still counts. That's like telling Stephen Hawking you don't want help with your math homework. At one point after Robbie Robertson showed up, Russell Crowe restarted the whole album. Fed up, Matt and Trey left. Despite the experience, the two have maintained they were still on good terms with Russell, saying he's pretty kind to them, he's just a bad musician, but a good actor. This combined with his violent behavior led to the pair making fun of him. The boys want to watch a new trailer, which is premiering during Floating Around the World with Russell Crowe. The show stars Russell Crowe and his beloved companion Taga, who travel around the world and pick fights with whoever they come upon. Why don't you choke on some pig vomit, you stupid sods? Why can't this guy control his temper? Well, you are just gonna stand there or you're gonna fight! And I have to say, this is another one of my favorite episodes. The theme song alone, I'll be honest, I listen to it on my own time, especially when I write scripts. At one point, it seems as though Matt and Trey told the audience how they really felt about Russell Crowe through Tugga. I'm sorry if I keep calling him Tugga, not Tugger, it's just, it's stuck in my head. Because Russell Crowe's singing is so bad, it makes Tugga want to no longer be alive. <laughs> What's that, Tugger? You say you really love the songs on my album? <laughs> on the bright side, it makes Russell Crowe want to take up a cause, and he decides that in Tugger's name, he shall fight cancer. So, from now on, I'm gonna spend all my spare time fighting cancer. Right!
Where is that <laughs> cancer anyway? Again, like, I'm sorry, I'm not doing this on purpose. Rather than mental health awareness or on a live prevention, too bad he can't find cancer. But to his credit, they did find a man with cancer. Take uh, that, cancer! And uh, that! <laughs> I don't know whether or not I'm allowed to laugh. Is it wrong? Despite everything Matt and Trey have said, Russell Crowe, again, is still friends with them. He wrote them a letter congratulating them on Team America, which premiered after this episode. He also went on 60 Minutes, where he was asked about his opinion. And he said, because I don't want to find the clip, I think they are very, very funny men, and I wish them Godspeed, and I hope they continue to do what they're doing. For me, if there was something for me to learn from it, it is the innocuous thing because I think the whole thing was a fight. I think my whole career was a struggle. I was born in Salton, New Zealand, in Wellington, and they're talking up here in a hotel in New York. That's a long way. Too bad a lot of people were not convinced by the statement. They think that he was offended, but tried to be polite about it. Personally, I don't care. Because even if he did not like it, it was still good of him to try to be friendly about it and say in his own words, they're my friends, but even if I did not like this, I still respect their opinion. I think some reports have even said his only complaint is he did not get to voice himself because he would have if they asked. Still, one thing is certain. Wherever Russell Crowe is now, he's doing what he most loves. Making movies, making songs, and floating around the world. Now, do we have a problem? <laughs> no, sir. No, Mr. Mouse. No, Mr. Mouse. Oh, those poor boys being jerked around by Disney and Mr. Muse. It might surprise you, but I used to be a huge Jonas Brothers fan. I still remember going to Borgata to see one of their concerts when I was like 14. No wonder this was one of the first South Park episodes I watched. In the ring, Kenny takes his new girlfriend to their concert because he wants her to suck his softball for a straw, so to speak. At the concert, just as Kenny is gonna get what he wants, Tammy is told to go backstage to meet the band, along with a dozen or so other girls, and you know she ain't gonna say no. She's just a girl who can't say no. Hey there, girls! The band tells them that rather than asking for favors, they want them to wear purity rings. As they explain, It means we are going to be pure. And it means we stay away from bad stuff and avoid people who swear or watch naughty TV shows. That's just how we roll. Do they have to go to one of those creepy balls in order to solidify the promise? Being celebrities and all, Tammy obeys. Be sure to give a ring to all the kids you care about. You want to be kid hipsters like us and wear purity rings too? Okay. And she makes Kenny wear a ring too. In reality, the Jonas Brothers are using the purity rings in order to maintain a family-friendly image, while also becoming symbols at the same time. To put it one way, See, if we make the posters with little girls reaching for your junk, then you have to wear purity rings or else Disney Company looks bad. <laughs> the purity rings cause Kenny to turn into a boring as heck board of wood, and it seems as though he isn't the only one. The Jonas Brothers don't like the rings as much as anybody, feeling as though they're deceiving little girls, but are forced to keep it up by Mickey Mouse. At one point, they try to tell Mickey they won't perform if he continues to force them to wear the rings, and they are rewarded in kind. You don't <laughs> talk to me like that, <laughs> you little piece of shit. <laughs> Oh, good. The boys track down the Jonas Brothers to Denver in order to tell them about Kenny. But Mickey thinks they were sent from DreamWorks. Cartman? You weren't ruining my plans this time, DreamWorks! <laughs> Dude, who the hell did that? <laughs> Mickey, being the idiot that he is, tattles on himself to the fans, telling them he thinks they're all stupid and the Christians are even stupider. They believe in a talking dead guy! <laughs> 
Yeah, no wonder they're angry. This is a show where Jesus has his own talk show. Jenny and the Jonas Brothers are finally free. The Disney purity ring venture will most likely now prove a marketing bust as Mickey returns to Valhalla to slumber and feed. Even though I thought Valhalla was only for heroes, unless maybe he fought Valhalla, now the feelings of the Jonas Brothers towards this episode were pretty complicated. Their feelings towards it was the one question that was always off limits to reporters and journalists. Nick Jonas did go on record to give one PR Disney approved statement to the Orlando Sentinel, saying, we are always open to make fun of ourselves. For us, we're so focused on what we're doing with this tour and our album, we didn't have much time to see it. But while off limits to journalists, it seems as though the fans haven't gotten the memo. In 2016, while the fan was on hiatus, Nick and Joe Jonas participated in several AMAs on Reddit, and the topic of this episode constantly came up. To summarize their feelings, basically, at first, they did not like the episode, but they've come around around to appreciate it and found it pretty funny. When it first came out, I didn't think it was funny to be honest, but probably because I was actually living all of that in real time. So it just made it harder to come and live your life as a young person and have all that going on. But years later, and once the purity rings were no longer around, it was pretty funny to me. And I've actually watched the episode a few times. I loved it. When it first came out, I was so pumped. I know that Nick was really kind of not into watching it, but I thought it was the funniest thing at the time. And it's kind of a compliment. Because obviously, if you go to a comedy show and they pick you out and make fun of you, you can't heckle back. You gotta just take it and enjoy it. And for me, I've always been a fan, and I knew that this was kind of a wow, we made it moment. And also, they were kind of attacking Disney more than me. So I I didn't really feel threatened. Now I watch it back and laugh and Mickey kicked my ass. So I won the episode by being beat up by Mickey Mouse. I gotta say that explanation is a little detailed, but I agree. It's nice to laugh at what others think of you every now and again. Like me being a fairy. We all know that's fake, right? You guys know that, right? Guys? Please have a seat, Lord. Hi, Carol. Lord? <gasps> it's Lord. Well, Randy. In gluten-free Ebola, the boys are hated by the whole school for the mean things they said about them prior to go fun yourself. To win back everybody's love, the boys decide to throw a huge party and invite Lord to play. Apparently, Randy works with Lord's uncle, and clearly Lord isn't a major celebrity what places to be. She might not be Taylor Swift, but I'm sure she totally come out to the middle of nowhere just to play at a party. Sure enough, they don't get Lord. They get Randy in a dress, and he's rocking it, girl. As you can expect by now, there's a story to this. Originally, the episode wasn't supposed to make fun of Lord. The joke was that Randy could not get Lord to play. Maybe she didn't want to go. Maybe Maybe he was lying, who knows. So he dressed up as her and just sang. But the audience thought this meant Lord really was Randy. So the crew just rolled with it. This launched into a season long storyline where we learn Randy is Lord and maintains two identities simultaneously. Kind of like I do as a YouTuber. Meaning I now understand the struggles Randy. I wonder if Randy has dreams where he's his other persona the same way I do. Unlike the other celebrities, here it's actually multiple episodes, not just one. The next episode, the sissy, establishes that he pretends to be Lord for the attention and the money. Throughout the whole season, Randy has to maintain a secret identity, while reporters and even his friends attempt to sniff him out once and for all. You might be asking yourself, how did this come about? Well, one day he sung a song in the bathroom at work and just went from there. But because he's somebody who would not be on the cover of a magazine, and likely because of his past performances with boy bands, he invented the persona of Lord, a teenager from New Zealand who hit it big. Yeah, I don't understand you at all. A lot you know. He sings the songs himself, then edits them with pitch shifting to sound like a teenager, or Saya. 
Thea. No joke, that really is her singing those songs. Surprised she wasn't an episode yet, just saying. And then he collects the money. Occasionally, he goes out in public dressed as Lord, like the concerts and whatnot, and even gets to use the ladies' room at work. I like the women's bathroom. I feel safe there. Being able to use that bathroom is critical to my identity, to my music. Which, why would you want to do that? Not because, like, I'm biased or you have to use the bathroom you were assigned at birth. But speaking from experience, the girls' rooms are dirty and icky and have super long lines. Like, in college, I used to sneak into the boys' bathrooms because they were much cleaner and I got out of there so much quicker. As luck would have it, the real Lord loves South Park and loves the fact that the show feeds her. She's filmed several videos of herself singing the song and posting them on her Instagram. She even commented, I was thinking, yeah, he has a mustache. I mean, I have a mustache, but is it that prominent? Trust me, girl. No, it's not. <laughs> But it was someone's dad pretending to be me. If I were ever featured on South Park, I'd probably be the same way. It's more than you can say about Kanye. Admittedly, he was one of the candidates. It's just, it's complicated. So I guess he's getting his own video one day. Well, then we're just gonna have to save Terrence and Philip ourselves. What? Think about it, you guys. What would Brian Boitano do? He'd figure out a way to rescue Terrence and Philip before they're executed. What would Brian Boitano do besides watch this movie and sing this song? I don't know. But if it weren't for the movie, I wouldn't know who he is. Or that he's more awesome than Brian <laughs> Dennehy. During the movie, the boys try to get their parents to listen to them about what'll happen if Terrence and Philip are executed. But they're too busy to care. In order to inspire themselves, they start to sing about the exploits of Brian Boitano and wonder what would Brian Boitano do where he's betrayed as an absolute chad. He defeats Kublai Khan, figure skates blindfolded, and makes a hobby out of saving fair maidens. No wonder he's so gosh darn inspirational. With just a quick song, this has pretty much kept the real Brian Boitano on the map until the end of time. He loves it too. He originally went into the theater thinking the film was going to mock him harshly. But once the song came on, he found it all pretty surreal and loved how much people were laughing. I know the feeling, Brian. It's like the wonderful song from Wicked, or More is Better from Mean Girls. To this end, Brian Boitano has pretty much made a second job writing off of the fame brought from this movie, and I don't blame him. He got permission from the creators to make merchandise, and he regularly gives the proceeds to charity. He even had a show on Food Network called What Would Brian Boitano Make? Trust me, it makes sense. One of his pastimes is cooking, and he's been doing that since his 20s. The movie's theme song is even the show's theme song. In 2006, he described it as, It's become such a part of my life. Kids who don't know who I am or what I did at the Olympics meet me and think I'm cool because I'm in South Park, which I think is pretty true. I'm not into sports. I don't even know how most of them work. If it weren't for South Park, I'd probably never know he was even a thing. So thank you, Matt and Dre. Steven, these boys had a point. You haven't let these doe-eyed children affect your judgment, have you, George? Don't forget, you belong to me. Free hat. Free hat. Free hat. I'm sorry I had to. The opportunity was right there. But yep, this dude is number one. I could always make a joke about his perverse bedroom activities, but I've done it plenty before. Besides, I thought AI Artificial Intelligence was a good movie and the ending was a balls. No, the reasoning for the placement is because of what happened after the episode aired. In Free Hat, Spielberg and Lucas decide to remaster a lot of their old films films, starting with Raiders of the Lost Ark. The boys disapprove of this, but their efforts are for naught. I'm gonna blow up the Prince Spielberg! Your persistence surprises even me! Surely you don't think you can escape from this premiere? Unfortunately, fortunately, after remastering the original Raiders, Lucas and Spielberg presented before an invited audience, and they rot away. Oh! Ah! 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 Being 
that artists shouldn't try to remaster their old works. Admittedly, this section has a huge cause and effect. First off, this is one of those morals that Matt and Trey have grown to dislike. After the episode aired, they realized why Spielberg liked it, especially since they remastered a lot of old South Park episodes. From my comment section, I can see that a lot of my viewers are artists, either as a career or as a hobby, and I'm sure you understand the feeling of looking back at your old works and realizing, ugh, why did I do that? If I knew then, would I know now? You might regret it until you realize you only got better because you worked at it, and now you know better. However, they did say that while they respected Spielberg and Lucas, should not have edited their original works without providing people another way to see the originals. Which, I guess, kind of makes sense. You can still see the old South Park episodes, just not on TV. And then there's Spielberg's response, which is really complicated. According to the duo, they got what they refer to as the nicest f you letter from Spielberg. He said that he had finally arrived now that he's one of the villains in South Park, and that he and Lucas would continue to remaster their old movies. As it turns out, he later said that he did like the episode and mostly meant the letter as a joke. Now, this would be enough to put him on the list, but that's not all. The reason this episode was written was because Spielberg remastered E.T. and changed a lot of stuff. Most infamously, the guns were changed to walkie-talkies. All the E.T. effects have been digitally upgraded. All the guns have been digitally changed to walkie-talkies. And the word terrorist has been changed to hippie. But unlike Lucas, Spielberg actually came to regret the changes he was making, and vowed to never do it again. Through a certain perspective, you could say that this episode changed Spielberg's mind. And as Trey Parker put it, if it was because of him that Spielberg decided not to change his movies, it made him feel just as proud as wearing a dress to the Academy Awards. Hey kid, you need to get off the roof now. That's cool. I'm done making my video anyways. <laughs>